stupid. Why are you putting on makeup and telling these stories? This is disrespectful. Okay, if you don't like it, bye. Hi guys, welcome back. How are you? How's your week? If you are new here, my name is Sarah. Hi, welcome. <laughs> so what we're doing today is I'm gonna tell a crew crime story and I'm gonna put on my makeup at the same time. We've already decided we like it. Okay. I have noticed in recent weeks, recent months, as our audience grows and there's more people watching, which is a good thing, there's an uptick in these comments telling me how terrible what I'm doing is and how they hate it and it's so disrespectful and all these things and that's cool. My style of storytelling is not everybody's cup of tea, but you know what the great part about life is? You don't have to watch it. I originally had a different story planned for this particular video because today, if you didn't realize, is halfway to Halloween. I had a different story that was more Halloween related. Um, I guess I'll just save it for later because this story is too hot. In today's episode of Crew Trime, Crew Trime, Crew Trime, this is the story of Kristen Smart. So let's just get right into it, okay? Today's episode of Crew Trime was recommended to me by my friend Anna. Hi, Anna. These events took place in her hometown of San Luis Obispo, California in 1996. And you have likely seen this case hot in the news very recently because of a podcast called Your Own Backyard. Um, a little bit of a disclaimer, and I don't normally do these with these videos because there's always gonna be details that are left out for reasons. There's always gonna be things that maybe I got not quite 100% accurate. I try to always review police reports and court records to make sure that the timeline and the meat and potatoes of the story are as correct as they can be, but many of the details that I'm using in today's story have come from that podcast. I cannot recommend it enough. It is like chef's kiss perfection. Everything about that podcast is incredible. There are no other retellings of this story that are as accurate and detailed as that podcast, including today's video, Run Do Not Walk. Go listen to that podcast. Also, today's crew crime story is unsolved, friends but we're getting close. Kristen Denise Smart was born on February 20th, 1977 in Augsburg, West Germany to Stan and Denise Smart, both school teachers. Oh no, is this empty? Come on. A few years after Kristen was born, Stan and Denise packed up their cuckoo clocks and moved back to the United States. And they settled in Stockton, California. A few years later, her brother Matthew was born and then another sister, Lindsay, was born, completing their little family. Kristen was a doting sister, organized, energetic, very friendly. She was a great student, an athlete, and she loved traveling, even participating in the exchange student program. Kristen made friends very easily and she stayed in touch with most of everybody that she encountered. Kristen also loved the water and she excelled at swimming. After she graduated from high school, Kristen spent that summer as a lifeguard and a camp counselor at Camp Mokalea in Hawaii. That fall, Kristen headed to college at California Polytechnic State University, or Cal Poly, in San Luis Obispo, California. It's about 200 miles from where she grew up in Stockton. So Kristen initially planned to study architecture, but she switched to communication so that she could be a world traveling journalist. So as her first year at Cal Poly went on, she struggled a little bit. It didn't come as easy to her as high school life that was, you know, very structured with swim meets and all that stuff. Transitioning to independent living was a little difficult for her to balance. It's not that she wasn't doing great in school, but growing up's hard. Kristen was close to her parents, but you know, like all kids in college, she was telling them kind of the sanitized version. You know, not that Kristen was doing anything super illicit, but like, you know, much of her social behavior, like partying and drinking, <laughs> that wasn't really part of the conversation, which, you know, that's perfectly normal. The point is, is that Kristen was a very normal girl doing normal stuff, and they just tried to give her room to explore and make her own choices and all that stuff. So in the springtime, you know, the end of her freshman semester there at Cal Poly, Friday night, May 24th, 1996, it's Memorial Day weekend, Kristen and her friend Margarita 
who lived in her dorm with her. It wasn't her roommate. Her roommate was out of town. Kristen and her friend decided to try to find a party to go to. So they connected with a pair of girls that lived at the end of their hall and they all headed out. It was super quiet, you know. A lot of people left for the weekend. They got to a party at a nearby house, but it was kind of a bust, so they left. They kept at it. The girls eventually landed near the unofficial frat houses off campus. But by this time, most of the girls were over it, okay? They're, they're done. So the girls decided that they were gonna go back and Kristen wanted to stay out. They said, okay girl, stay safe, see you later. They parted ways. So just after 10 p.m., Kristen arrived at the Kappa Chi fraternity house on Crandall Way. They were celebrating a, a few birthdays. This party wasn't really what you might be picturing, like the movie Old School, where it's just like wall-to-wall -wall people, crazy debauchery, no. It was just a regular old party with just Drinking and drinking, drinking. <laughs> it was smallish for fraternity standards, um, with most of the guests hanging out in the backyard listening to jam band music, fish, Gravel Dead, a lot of hacky sacks happening. Kristen flitted around the party like a little social butterfly. She introduced herself as Roxy. She was wearing Roxy board shorts. Not sure if like that was a name that she just decided to go by that night or if other people called her that. I guess she had a lot of different nicknames. So like I said, there was absolutely some serious drinking happening there, among other things. At the end of the night, around, you know, 1.30, 2 o'clock, you know, last call hours, as people were kind of filing out of the house to go home, Kristen was found passed out in the yard next door. Yikes. She was found by two other party goers, Tim Davis and Cheryl Anderson. They helped get Kristen back up on her feet and uh, helped to walk her home. And while they were walking the about half a mile back to campus, they were joined by another party goer, Paul Flores. Paul was a student at Cal Poly also majoring in food science. What is that? I don't know. Tim left the little group first because his car was parked nearby and he just got in it and left. So now it's Cheryl and Paul helping Kristen, who's like, she's walking, but not by herself. At the intersection of Perimeter Road and Grand Avenue on the Cal Poly campus, Cheryl split off to head back to her dorm. If she had continued walking Kristen home, she would have had to double back. She didn't really want to, so she had asked Paul, are you good to continue helping her get back home? He's like, yeah, 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 sure, I got this. So she turned and went up, and they turned and went that way. Kristen lived in Mira Hall and Paul lived in Santa Lucia Hall. These are both the red brick buildings um, kind of next to each other. When they arrived at Santa Lucia Hall, which comes before Mira Hall, Paul stood at the entrance and watched Kristen walk the rest of the 40-ish yards to Mira Hall. Can you see where this is going? That was the last time Kristen was ever seen. That moment when she was walking alone to her dorm at Muir Hall. She wasn't carrying any ID or money. Cell phones were like not a thing. This is 1996. Now, like I said, Kristen's roommate, Crystal, had spent Friday night away from their dorm, but she came back on Saturday to find Kristen's bed scattered with the same things that were on it the Friday before, which means that Kristen had not slept in her bed that night. It didn't start to worry her really until Kristen wasn't home by Saturday night. So she started kind of asking around the dorms. By Sunday, her and the other girls really started to get concerned. And on Monday, they called the police because Kristen wasn't back in time for classes to resume on Tuesday. So they called campus police and campus police isn't, <laughs> It's very frustrating when you read into this how campus police handle this. They said, well, it's Memorial Day weekend. She might have just went on a spontaneous trip and just didn't tell anybody, so chill out. She's probably camping. Like, none of her personal items had moved. Her ID, key, nothing. Everything was in the room, so okay, she was camping. Anyways, at this point, the campus police called Kristen's parents. Did she come home for the weekend? Her friends are asking, like, they can't find her, what's going on? They had suggested to Kristen's mother, maybe she went on a spontaneous trip and Kristen's mom was like, maybe, I guess, you know, didn't really think too much about it. A missing persons report was not officially filed until Tuesday. And by that time, Kristen had not been seen for four days. So we all know that like the first 48 to 36 hours after someone is not seen missing. Those are really critical hours. In this case, everything that happened in that period 
lost. Police were just treating it like, you know, she was a runaway almost. There was no urgency. Once they did start investigating, they were piecing together the events from the night Kristen was last seen and they started poking around the campus for clues. The last three people who saw Kristen all said that they watched her walk off into the night, the last one being Paul Flores. When police started digging into Paul Flores, he was described by many as weird, but mostly harmless. He grew up in nearby Arroyo Grande. Arroyo, Arroyo Grande? Grande? Sorry. He was called Scary Paul by some of the people that he went to high school with because he was socially awkward, man. He spoke with a stutter, especially around girls, and he was just generally kind of a creep. He was also described as someone who drank pretty heavily, and when he drank, he didn't stutter anymore, which is probably why he drank. Got aggressive with girls, and people didn't like him because he would be, he would hit on girls in front of their boyfriends. The boyfriends were like, uh, what are you doing? Paul was not a great student at all. His GPA was like 0.6 or something. It was bad. Um, he had also, a few months before, gotten into some trouble one time for a drunken peeping Tom incident where he climbed up like a trellis and refused to leave. The girl called the police and he had a DUI arrest that had suspended his driver's license. You know, troubled this guy. So when police showed up at Paul's father's house, Paul's father's name is Reuben, when they showed up at his house to question Paul, he said that Paul wasn't home, but he would bring him to the precinct later that evening. Paul's mother, Susan, at this point did not live in the home. She and Reuben had filed for separation or just were separated or estranged somehow. And she lived in a house somewhere else <laughs> that they owned. So when Paul arrived at the precinct later that evening, Reuben had brought him to the police station for the questioning. He had a fresh black eye. Hmm, interesting. He had scratches on his hands and rug burns on his knees. And when police asked him, how, how did you get that shiner, man? He said he had gotten it playing basketball with a friend. That's not a crazy story, right? Everybody's caught an elbow in the face before. But when investigators questioned his friend that he said he was playing basketball with, the friend was like, no, he came, he arrived to the basketball game with that black eye because I asked him, what happened to you? How did Paul explain that black eye to you? And he said that he just woke up with it and didn't know where it came from. Okay, Paul. So police confronted Paul with the lie and he changed the story again and said that he got it because he was working on like a stereo in a truck and he like hit his head on the steering wheel. Okay. This is kind of the one police interview that they have with Paul. At a certain point in the interview, he started acting, you know, kind of weird. And he said he needed to leave because he needed to go clean up some stuff at his mom's house. And when they said, what do you mean, clean up what? He's like, I've been doing some concrete work at my mom's house and I need to go clean up the concrete. He wasn't under arrest, so they let him leave. So by now it's been a few weeks since Kristen was last seen. The school year is over and the students were gone. Kristen's family and other interested people and investigators were continuing the search for her in and around the Cal Poly campus. And by the time investigators had searched the dorms, like I said, they were empty. The custodial crews had also cleaned all of the rooms, including Paul's room and Kristen's room. A team of rescue dogs cadaver dogs. They were used in the search of the campus dorms. I think there was four dogs in this team. They went through several of the large buildings and the technique was a like a double blind. None of the handlers knew what the other handlers were doing. Nobody was telling each other if any of the other dogs had alerted, right? So everybody's just doing their own thing. Each one of the dogs alerted at the same door. It was room 128 in Santa Lucia Hall, Paul Flores's room. They all alerted at the, s the same points in the room. His bed, the trash can, and the phone. They even removed the mattress. They would alert where the mattress was. They took those items that the dogs were interested in and they mixed them up with other items that looked the same. Bingo, bango. 
they kept alerting on the ones from Paul's room. And let me just clarify, these dogs were not searching for Kristen Smart's scent. They were searching for the scent of human remains, like decomposition. It still took police another two weeks to get a warrant to search his home, his father's home. And then it took him another week to execute the warrant. On July 22nd, 1996, the search of the home was short and relatively uneventful. Although police did find like newspaper clippings underneath the mattress of Ruben Flores and Paul Flores. Why do you gotta put under your mattress, guys? That search was kind of like cursory, you know? They said later that they were just sort of looking for like her keys or items. They weren't looking for her. They didn't think that her, her body was there. And at that point, Paul's mother's home was not searched. I don't know if they knew that she didn't live there. So later that summer, Paul's mother's home was put up for rent. A young couple, Mary and Joe Lassiter, they moved in on October 1st. They had no idea who Susan and Paul were. Although it didn't take them long to figure it out because they started getting like random weird mail, like postcards and stuff. So a few weeks after moving in, Mary was cleaning her car in the driveway when something shiny caught her eye. So she bent down and found a single lady's earring. And on the back of the earring, it had like a dark reddish smudge. So Mary put the earring in a plastic baggie and eventually that earring was turned over to the police. Sometime later, Paul moved out of Arroyo Grande and enlisted in the Navy. He was scheduled to ship out for training that December, but the Smart family didn't want him to slip away, right? So they decided to press charges. On November 26, 1996, Stan and Denise Smart filed a $40 million wrongful death suit. The lawsuit worked because the Navy dropped Paul like a hot potato. And by this time, San Luis Obispo and the surrounding towns were covered in billboards and signs and all this looking for Kristen Smart. So this wrongful death suit filed by the Smart family subpoenaed testimony from Cheryl Anderson and Tim Davis and the Lassiters who'd moved into Paul's mother's home. Nothing really new came of the depositions, although the earring provided by the Lassiters did come back up. The Smart family didn't know about it. So the Smart family was asking the police or the sheriff's department, can we see this earring? Can we see this earring? And they were just really dragging their feet. And then finally they revealed they lost it. Ugh. So I don't, I don't know that they lost it on purpose. They say that when the earring was given to police, whoever received it never booked it into evidence and they decided on their own that it looked like a child's earring and couldn't be related to this case. Mary Lassiter actually found a very similar pair of earrings when she was out shopping one day around the same time and she bought them. She says the design is nearly identical to a necklace that Kristen is wearing in one of the wanted posters or missing posters. It gets better. A neighbor of Susan Flores, a 21 year old prep cook, lived directly across the street at the time and described seeing something that he would never forget. He said that he stood at his kitchen window watching Paul Flores and someone else sometime in May. He says that he watched them take turns shoveling in the backyard and wheelbarrowing to create a gaping four foot deep hole in Susan Flora's backyard. And this went on for like almost five hours late into the night. So in the middle of this moonlight construction jamboree, he saw both men carrying a rolled up rug with something heavy inside. You know, you can, you can tell. They're both on either side carrying this rug and then he watched them labor it into the hole and then cover it back up with dirt and then pour concrete over the top to form a slab. Susan's backyard had a lot of concrete in it. It sounded weird to me at first, but then you think about it, it's like a patio, cement area where you might put chairs and a table and stuff like that. It's not that weird. Anyways, it gets better folks. Mary Lassiter, living in Susan's home. She said that after they'd moved in, the owners did more work in the backyard, dug out some of the concrete, poured dirt in it, laid down more cement in the backyard, like, like a patio type area, like I was saying, and then laid more concrete, like so much concrete in this backyard. And hold on to your butts. This like blew my hair back. Okay. Mary said that in the months after they moved into the home, every day at 4.20 a.m., she would hear this beeping sound coming from the backyard. Like beep, 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 you know? 
they searched that backyard looking for the noise, you know, poking sticks in the ground, but they would only go so far because there's concrete under there. Eventually, the beeping stopped and never returned. 4.20 in the morning, was Kristen like a wake and bake kind of a gal? Maybe. But really, she was a lifeguard and because she was so junior in the place that she worked, she got the morning shift and had to be there by 5 a.m. So she had to get herself up and out to be there by 5 a.m., which would make sense why she would, might have had to set an alarm to get up at 4.20 in the morning. That's her watch in the backyard. You guys. Holy crap! Neighbors also testified that in the summer of 1996, they saw the planter boxes being cut out of the existing concrete after Kristen Smart disappeared, but before the Lassiter family moved in. So if we go back to the date that Paul was being questioned by police and said that he needed to leave to go clean up some concrete, all those dates check out and all that work happened before the day that he was questioned by police. So after the Lassiters um, provided their deposition to police about, you know, the beeping watch and all that stuff, Susan and Ruben Flores evicted them from the house. But before the move out date, Mary Lassiter allowed police to come to the house to inspect. On March 3rd, 1997, cadaver dogs and a geologist searched the property, but they didn't find anything. But the dogs did alert on a corner of the backyard where an aluminum trash can used to be. But that trash can was removed by Ruben Flores shortly after the Lassiters moved in. A ground penetrating radar inspection of the backyard revealed some anomalies, but not really like enough to justify further inspection. No excavation of the backyard was ever conducted. After a search warrant is completed, you know, the actions associated from a search warrant are completed, that warrant is donezo and can never be acted upon again. So if a new search needed to happen, you need a new warrant and you need new evidence. So remember, the Smart family has this wrongful death suit, right? And when Paul Flores was finally deposed almost two years later. He was accompanied by a lawyer, which is not a bad thing. He would only confirm his name and his birth date, and for every other question, he answered. On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. You don't want to say anything that might incriminate yourself. But they were asking him stuff like, when were you a student? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Oh. Where do you work? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Wouldn't answer any questions. He used this Fifth Amendment phrase like 30 times in a row. Now, I understand the importance of the Fifth Amendment, but listen, if, if you could just use it to not answer any questions ever, there, would n there wouldn't be anyone in prison. <laughs> So when you put all the pieces together, it seems to me that Paul took Kristen back to his room, take advantage of her drunkenness to rape her. I think that she came to and kind of realized what was going on and fought him off and that pissed him off, which explains his black eye and scratches. You know, I think she fought him off, but he overpowered her, probably strangling her or like hitting her until she died. I don't think he was like a predator searching for someone to murder, but he, I mean, I think he did. Anyways, I think he called someone to help him conceal Kristen's body. I think he called his dad. What I suspect is that the person who was seen with Paul at his mom's house digging the holes and stuff, I, I don't know who that was. But I also think that Reuben knew that that person could be a liability and they decided to relocate Kristen to someplace else. I think to his house or maybe somewhere in the boonies where he worked. He serviced payphones and you know, knew where a lot of remote areas were, where nobody would look. I think that Ruben laid down the hammer and they got a lawyer for Paul, who Paul, to his credit, has kept his mouth shut since that deposition. Like, not a word, not a word. Maybe some of Kristen's clothing, that watch, is in that concrete in Susan's backyard. That's what I think. That's just my opinion. Now, listen, innocent until proven guilty. Okay, fair enough but put the pieces together. Come on. Anyways, so years passed with like no update to the case. But on May 25th, 2002, on the sixth year anniversary of Kristen's disappearance, she was declared dead in absentia, which means, you know, absent. The Flores family has filed suit against the Smart family, citing, you know, emotional distress, harassment. I mean, wow, wow. 
Also, this case has never been declared a cold case. Doing that would release all of the evidence and information. Police are still actively investigating this case. By not declaring it a cold case, it keeps it open. And every year it gets renewed, you know, and they have to declare how much time they are dedicating to it, which is not a lot, but you know, there's Anyway, so since the most recent San Luis Obispo Sheriff Ian Parkinson took office in 2011, the Sheriff's Office said that it has served 18 search warrants, searched nine separate locations, submitted 37 evidence items for modern DNA testing, and recovered 140 new items of evidence, conducting 91 in-person interviews, and they have written 364 supplemental reports. On September 6th, 2016, the San Luis Obispo Sheriff's Office announced a new lead in the case. Cadaver dogs inspected the Cal Poly campus and alerted in a few locations near the P. It's like a, the letter P you know, for Polytechnic. An excavation was conducted in multiple sites and after three days there were some items recovered from the hillside. We don't know what they were, but yet again, nothing in the case really moved closer to confirming the identity of Kristen's killer, the location of her body, or anything else. So beginning in September 2019, Chris Lambert's podcast, Your Own Backyard, started. And listen, if you have not listened to that podcast, stop, stop this, stop what, stop what you're doing listen to it. It's so good. It's so incredibly well-researched, well-paced, well-produced, everything. It's so good. And it's so good, in fact, that public interest has gone through the roof. People started coming forward with more information and tips, and the interest turned the heat up on the Flores family, too. Because of the interest in the popularity of this podcast, you know the Flores family is listening. And maybe they're even talking to each other file that away for later. So with new witnesses coming forward, and these are people who didn't speak to the police because they just thought whatever they had to offer was not important, it's insignificant, whatever. But once you put all those little tiny pieces together, you see the whole picture. So nothing is not important, okay? Always speak up. Anyways, okay, so with new witnesses coming forward, that has created new evidence and that justifies new search warrants. By late January 2020, the San Luis Obispo Sheriff's Department confirmed that two trucks previously owned by Paul Flores had been taken into evidence, and there were numerous items of interest that were found. They'd also authorized the monitoring and seizure of computers, cell phones, and text messages. And by February, search warrants were served simultaneously at the homes of Paul Flores, Ruben Flores, Susan Flores, and Paul's sisters. Homes. We haven't really heard a whole lot about the sister. Evidence that was recovered in those searches led to the service of another warrant to search Paul Flores' home in April 2020. They just keep searching, man. Keep searching. On March 15th, 2021, a search warrant was issued for Ruben Flores' home, including the use of cadaver dogs and ground penetrating radar. The dogs indicated or alerted on an older model Volkswagen at the home and it was towed in for further inspection. On April 13th, 2021, just a couple weeks ago, Paul Flores and Ruben Flores were arrested. Paul was charged with the murder of Kristen Smart with no bail. 80-year-old Ruben Flores was also arrested and charged with accessory to murder after the fact, and his bail was set at $250,000. So in addition to the arrest for Kristen Smart's murder, Paul has several drunk driving convictions. He has a pending weapons charge and is being investigated for two separate sexual assault complaints. Ruben has no previous criminal history other than, you know, maybe helping to cover up a murder for 25 years. Allegedly. And at Ruben's advanced age and failing health, he might not even make it to trial if it comes to that. Paul and Ruben Flores have both flatly denied any involvement in the Kristen Smart disappearance or murder or anything involving it at all. They have both entered not guilty pleas, and Paul Flores' attorney is Robert Sanger, who you might remember from the Michael Jackson molestation case of 2005. So they had definitely called in the big guns, okay? Now, I don't know what specifically, what evidence has been discovered that was enough to arrest Paul and Ruben Flores, but Ruben's attorney has told news sources that if we even call it evidence, it was so minimal as to shock the conscience. 
In the last couple days, Ruben Flores has been released on bail. There was a hearing to reduce the dollar amount, and I guess they granted it, and he is now at home awaiting trial. They did confiscate his passport because they don't want him running away. There has not been a trial, there's no convictions, so this case is definitely still unsolved, but you guys, it is like this close to the end. It, this is like rapidly evolving, you know. There's all these news reports now that this, the most recent search of Ruben's home reveals strong evidence that Kristen's body was there and has been moved because the ground penetrating radar can show you where like soil has been like dug up because of the way that it settles. I don't science, okay? I don't know things. But I'm on pins and needles, I'm on the edge of my seat. If you wanna hear more details, backstory, history of the case, updates, and every little nugget in this case that exists, including a conversation with the sheriff. Maybe it's not the sheriff, maybe it's a detective, somebody close to the case. Listen to the podcast, I will link it down in the description box. If you have any information about this Kristen Smart disappearance, or the case, or Paul Flores, or Ruben Flores, or anything like that, this case is still open. I will put a link down below for tips to the Sheriff's Department. For now, that is the story of Kristen Smart. Stay tuned. I, I hope to provide an update as soon as one is available. If you are curious as to my nail color, my earrings, uh, any of the makeup that I might have used today, just check down in the description box. Everything will be linked for you. If you have a crew crime story that you think I might be interested in, then please leave that down in the comments. I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week, and you can follow me on most of the other socials as well. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! I need a brush to... You know, it's more... It's more... My stomach is growling, you guys. Growling! So thanks for those of you who enjoy this. <laughs> a missing's... Per a missing's... A missing's persons. You know... Shit. Something died in his room. I gotta get my shit together. Hang on. Hi! Hi! Hello. Oh, you bitch. Is it recording? <laughs> How are you doing? How's your week? Nope. I don't care. You fucking did it. Get on it. Hello? Yes?